Hello. Welcome to the uh, Queer Wedding Experience at the Crossroads of Love and Community. I'm Lawrence Broughton. And I'm Michael Broughton. And we are the founders of Black Gay Weddings and the host of this five-part panel discussion. We co-title this series in part at the Crossroads of Love and Community because community has a big role to play in making everyone feel loved and welcome. This entire series is intended to address some of the issues that we as LGBTQI plus couples of color experience when planning and executing what is supposed to be one of the best days of our lives. So here we stand at the crossroads of love and community, not by choice, but because our community still fails to fully understand the concept that all love is love. In a second, we will give control of this, the discussion over to our moderator, we want to thank all of you for joining us and all of our panelists for stepping up and being a part of this conversation. Jordan, it's all yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I am just so glad to be here and welcome everybody that's coming in to the session, all of our attendees that registered and are also watching this on the replay. This is going to be a very informative, um, heartfelt session that we're going to get into. I have been waiting for this all week long and i just want to let our uh, attendees know if you have a question at any point in time for our panelists please put it in the q a section um, of your dashboard just navigate down there and go ahead and put that in there the chat is great but in order to get the questions please put those down there and I guess I should probably introduce myself. Uh, my name is Jordan Maney. I'm the owner of All the Days, which is a wedding planning firm based in San Antonio, Texas. And I have adored each and every one of these people on this panel from afar for a while. And although I'm saddened by the circumstances that it took for us to come here to this moment, I am excited and galvanized by what can come out of this moment as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce everybody that is here. Um, first of all, Michael and Lawrence of Black Gay Weddings. Thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about them. Lawrence Broughton is the owner and CEO of Broughton Media Group, LLC, a 24-year retired veteran of the U.S. Air Force. Thank you so much for your service. Lawrence has a bachelor's degree in information systems, three master's degrees in human resources, public administration, and journalism, because of course Lawrence does. <laughs> His vision is for Black Gay Weddings to become the LGBTQ plus community of color's premier uh, feature publication. He is joined with his husband, Michael Broughton, who is the owner and CEO, COO, excuse me, of Broughton Media Group, a world traveler, floral designer, and licensed mortician. Michael, with the help of his husband, created Black Gay Weddings to be a safe place where LGBTQ couples of color could share their love stories with the world. Thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Glad to have you. Of course, we have Kim. We have Ms. Kim of NOLA Event Planners and Productions. She has been the CEO since 2000, and I've been, in her words, a hostess with the mostest. Her client list includes New Orleans Mayor LaToya Cantrell, City Councilwoman Cindy Wynn, Patty LaBelle, Patty LaBelle, <laughs> and David Tatera. In 2019, NOLA Event Planners and Productions team also had the esteemed privilege of producing Dillard University's 150th anniversary gala. As a full service event production and design company, they provide the solutions that you need. Thank you so much, Kim, for joining us. Thank you. And we also have Braun. Hi, Braun who is a, an award-winning floral and event designer and devoted his career to navigating clients through the creative process and transforming their visions into exquisite events since 2014. Fondly referred to as the flower guy, he is a lead creative and floral designer of the flower guy, Braun. He provides bespoke design and styling experiences for weddings and events of all types. Braun deeply values his interactions with clients and peers alike and understands the power of making connections through design. His motto is, we don't sell flowers, we sell experiences. Thank you, Braun, for joining us. 
Thank you so much for having me. And then we have April Brown, who is the founder of Tool and Tinsel Event Company, which provides intuitive event management, design and coordination in the Washington DC area. April's journey into the events industry began seven years ago when she was working for one of the top wedding planners in Atlanta, Georgia. Over the years, she has worked with some of the top vendors in the industry and developed a deep passion for creating custom experiences that perfectly showcase each client's unique vision and personality. In her free time, she enjoys baking, crafting, entertaining, spending time with her wife, Nicole, and looking fly. Like, I'm not even mad. Like, <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And then lastly, we are joined by Jamel Wooten, who is a wife, mother to a 24-year-old son, Air Force veteran, thank you for your service, thank and you. an award-winning wedding officiant in Atlanta. With the encouragement of, and support of her wife and passion for marriage equality, she became the modern officiant. She and her wife had a difficult time finding someone to marry them, and the process was discouraging and disappointing. She strives to help make the wedding experience exciting and memorable for couples whose friends and families may not be supportive of their decision to marry the person they love. Though she specializes in LGBTQ plus weddings, she marries all couples in love. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So we're going to we're going to segue into these questions. Again, everybody who is an attendee, if you have a question, please put that in the Q&A. Um, section of your dashboard and we will get to those at the end but I really just want to dive into these questions into the meat and potatoes of this of this panel and I'm going to start off with you Michael and Lauren what barriers did you have to overcome as a black and gay couple to fully enjoy your wedding planning process hmm. well first of course we're black <laughs> Secondly, we're gay, and that makes us a double discrimination case just waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. We really weren't sure how vendors would receive us, so when we called to schedule appointments, we asked them if they had ever worked with any same-sex couples or any African-Americans for that matter. Uh, weddings and funerals are considered major events in the African-American community, so we wanted to be sure that the vendors we chose uh, would be a good fit for us and that they would be comfortable with doing business with two african-american gay men mm -hmm. we wanted the vendors to be knowledgeable of our heritage because there were certain aspects of our culture that we wanted to include in our wedding ceremony yeah. i think the very first barriers that i had to deal with personally were um, self-imposed uh fear uh fearful that the people we love uh, would struggle with being a part of our celebration because it's a gay wedding. Um, doubt, uh, doubting whether our friends and loved ones would find us worthy enough to come to Vegas and hear us say I do. And lastly, trust, uh, trusting that every vendor would, um, who we chose to be as part of our special day would actually be truly committed to delivering what we asked them to. So, um, <laughs> You know, Michael was, was teasing me at, at one point that, uh, you know, I had actually- He had his own blueprint. I had a binder <laughs> uh, full of uh, blueprints, plans, did, floor plans, did. and uh, inventory, color-coded inventory. It was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, but the vendors that we chose were definitely uh, well worth our effort. Yeah. And, uh, I think and they sacrificed it. a lot for us. Yeah. And it's funny because somebody in chat was like, Virgo or Capricorn? <laughs> <laughs> Virgo. <laughs> Virgo all the way. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm a Libra, Libra. so. <laughs> Libra power, I'm right there with you. Um, what about April? I got a question for you. Have you ever felt like you had to hide parts of yourself um, in business and to your vendors or clients? And if you, if you didn't, why do you think, what do you think uh, that is? Um, so for me personally, it's really, really important for me to feel like I'm a good fit for my clients and that they're mm -hmm. also a good fit for me. Just like it's a privilege for me to work with my clients. I also feel like, you know, it's a privilege for them to work with me as well. This is a mutual, um, relationship. 
and there has to be mutual respect there. So I'm very upfront with everyone I work with um, that, hey, I'm married, I have a wife, I'm openly gay. Um, and if that's something that makes them uncomfortable, um, then obviously I'm not gonna be the best fit for them. You know, we when you're planning weddings and especially like Lawrence and Michael said, these are very important milestones in someone's life. So we're gonna be working together a lot and very closely. So it's really important for, um, you know, them to feel comfortable with me. So, you know, I'm a firm believer that not all money is good money. Um, mm -hmm. And if I'm not a good fit, I'm, you know, I'm just not a good fit. So I really like to make sure that I'm open, honest, who I am with my personality so that I attract the um, appropriate clientele for me and my business. And the thing that's wild to me is that shouldn't even have to be a thing that you have to consider in doing business, right? It shouldn't even have to be a thing, but oftentimes it becomes one. It's that invisible barrier. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I want to jump to Kim. Uh, there have been a lot of conversations, a lot of panels, and, you know, there's a lot of uh East Coast representation, there's a lot of West Coast uh, representation, and you are unique in that you are in New Orleans. You're in the, the <laughs> old deep South, right? <laughs> um, how is it different for you being a progressive ally without like almost the comfort of being in a New York City or in LA? What is that like for you? Let me sip. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. So I'm in the South and I will tell you, you know, in the South, below the Mason-Dixon line, it is different. So for me being an ally, I've always been comfortable. I don't have issues with any of that. And I've been a nurse 22 years. So, you know, I deal with all walks of life, but it is the South. And I tell clients immediately when we, we start talking during our consultation and I'll ask them, okay, so you're getting married. Do you have someone to marry you? Or do you want to have an officiant or a judge? What is your preference? And they will say, I want a pastor. I want to be married by a pastor. We're Christians. We want to be married by a pastor. And we have the tough conversation. I think the biggest thing is to be honest. And I'll say, well, look, we have officiants who will do your marriage. They're progressive. And the South is a little bit different from East and West Coast, but we do have officiants. And so I think as a planner, as any vendor, it's your responsibility to be an advocate for your client. So you should have a list of vendors who are friendly, who are not just tolerant, but accepting. And who offer premarital counseling and who are okay with the tough questions and admitting the vulnerability. You know, I may not have all the answers or I don't know how to answer or what I may say wrong, but I do want you to know that love is love. I will marry you guys. And we do have churches. So I created a list of vendors who are progressive, who are openly um, um, accepting and I facilitate that process so it's not uncomfortable. Everyone does not want to be married by a judge, but I do have the conversation and say, look, we're in the South. It is what it is. I can't change that, but there are allies and we can make this process easy. And I do advocate for my clients. Oh, I love hearing that. That does my heart <laughs> good. I'm, I'm a little neighbor right to the, to the <laughs> West of you in Texas. Oh God, the country popped out. Sorry. Um, thank you so much for that answer, Kim. I'm going to go to Braun. Um, Cause you've been doing, you've had a lot of background work going on in the past month or so with the yeah. unity through community initiative. That's just Absolutely. been all over social media. Um, and you've always really advocated for inclusion when it comes to the black experience in our industry. My question for you is, do you feel like you've been able or given space to advocate for all aspects of your identity in this industry? You know, Jordan, that's a, a great question. And honestly, it has not been until recently that I have even given myself the space to even embrace or address the fact that I am a gay Black man in this industry. I think that what I have felt forced to do, or inclined to do rather, is to lead with what I feel like people see first. And I feel like people see my color 
long before they see the rainbow. It's almost like a beautiful rainbow that we poured black paint on it. And because blackness has not been embraced fully in our industry or even in society, I think that I have done myself a disservice, kind of complimenting on what Lauren said earlier. You know, I, I'm at an interesting crossroads. I'm at a very, very interesting crossroads that I am just now in 2020 getting to a point where I can, I can be fully 100% the flower guy Braun. Of course, the flower guy Braun is a black person, but he's also a gay black man. And I think that that should be celebrated. Um, but I think because the gay movement started so long ago that that is a more a easier picture of me to, to perceive for some, but then being in the Black community, that it can also be a very different experience. So I think that we all have to kind of do some soul searching and some homework and really settle on what we're going to establish as who we are and how we're going to move forward as a community. Because you mentioned unity through community, and I'm so glad you did, because unity through community is not just a Black movement. This is a movement for everyone. I don't care if you're Latino, I don't care if you're gay, I, none, of, none of the things that we use in society to separate each other applies to unity through community. So I really want to make sure that that message is loud and clear. Unity through community is a movement for everyone to get behind, supportive of every community that is represented in society. So. Bron, that was such a good answer. You got everybody in the chat fired up. Oh, good. Let me check the chat out. What's, what's going on on the hotline bling? <laughs> it's so silly. Oh, okay. I'm going to pass it to you, Jamel. As a queer Black woman uh, that serves a variety of couples, what are some anxieties that you have witnessed queer couples of color overcoming that straight ones don't have to? I see a lot of couples who struggle with the support of their family and friends. So I've actually had a couple of weddings where they um, delayed the wedding, waiting for their fathers or someone to show up. Um, so it's crazy that, you know, we don't have that support from everybody. And so I let these couples know that in these situations, not to worry about the people who aren't here, the ones that matter will show up. Um, also let them know that there is no certain way that a wedding has to be. You know, they see all these things in magazines or on television or these straight weddings, and they think that is the right way. And they try to imitate these heteronormative things that society tries to push on them. So I just let them know there's no certain way that it has to be. Something that is near and dear to me, two girls can wear dresses. They both can wear dresses. One does not have to be the man. Um, my wife and I both wore dresses at our wedding, and we look damn good in them too. Um, but two women can also wear suits. There are no rules. Um, I just let them know that I let them know about things that I've actually seen in the wedding industry that are different, like how they could be announced or pronounced to their guests, um, that they don't have to take the other's name and vice versa. Um, also, people in same sex relationships, one does not have to be the bride, one does not have to be the groom. Men do not like to be referred to as brides and women are not grooms. So um, I like for them all to actually add their own flavor to their wedding experience. This is a day that they're going to remember for the rest of their lives. You know, their guests won't remember what the guests will remember, what the cake or that Aunt Gladys got drunk and danced on the table, but they won't remember all the details of the day uh, the way the couple will. Isn't there an Aunt Gladys at every wedding, y'all? There's an Aunt yes. Gladys at every wedding. Oh, yes. Lord. Um, but I love that answer about like, you really can make your own rules when it comes to your wedding. Um, and it doesn't have to be defined in this rigid state that it has been. It's actually really liberating when you can step outside of that and really claim what you want for yourself. So thank absolutely. You and thank to you. piggyback on that, with COVID-19 <laughs> and the restrictions that we're all seeing, couples use that as an opportunity to wean out the Aunt Gladyses, okay? So everybody that's been wondering, how do I get my guest list down? Mother Nature took care of that for you. <laughs> I'm just saying, bye. Well, if y'all don't tweet that, that was a perfect, thank you, Bron. That was a perfect sound bite. Mother Nature took care of it. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna throw it back to Kim. Um, how do you think, again, kind of going back into the being in that deep South space, 
how do you think a lot of vendors have missed the mark when it comes to, you know, trying to be progressive, trying to be inclusive? We see this rallying cry really happening in our industry. Um, what has your experience been up to this moment and seeing how people have like not necessarily landed it? Right. Um, I will tell you just from my personal experience, um, people can tell when you're ingenuine. And Jamel touched on a lot of things about, you know, understanding that people do not have to fit into boxes or roles or a particular role. I think a lot of people have not put in the work to understand, and that's personal. It has nothing to do with now that it's legal for LGBTQ plus to be married. I think that goes beyond that. I mean, there are things in people they need to work out within themselves. Mm -hmm. I had another vendor tell me he did the, uh, it was a lesbian couple's wedding, but he struggled with doing their engagement session. And so they did not book him for the wedding and he could not understand why. And I said, he said, I just did not oppose them and I didn't know what to do. And I said, well, part of the problem is, did you know your couple before they showed up for the engagement session? Mm -hmm. Did you talk to them? Did you find out anything? You know, did you ask them to send you inspiration boards? Did you have those conversations? And I try to be a facilitator between vendors and my client, my couples, just so I can ease that and then not have them feel that people have to fit into certain pronouns or roles when talking. Mm -hmm. And I ask those questions. And I think one of the things is admitting ignorance and being vulnerable and open to learning, like putting in the work. When I meet couples, I ask questions. What are you wearing? What are we doing? If you're changing your names, mm -hmm. you know, we talk about family issues. Should I keep this family member away from this family member? No different than a heterosexual couple. I mean, you just need to have those conversations. And I think it goes both ways between the client and the vendor. Because as a client, you want to be open to and don't make assumptions that the vendor understands everything because what's for you is not for another couple. Um, yeah. You know, as black people, we know that. We don't like when people make assumptions about us being black people or I have a black friend or I have, oh, I have gay friends. I can do their wedding. I, I know someone gay. No, no one wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. So couples, we are doing this during Black Lives Matter. We're having to educate people about our experiences and it goes both ways, but you have to be vulnerable and be willing to learn and not have a closed mind about it. And you have to be comfortable. And I know some vendors who want to be um, vendors, but they are scared of the backlash. When I post couples, LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus couples, I get, I lose followers sometimes, but I'm okay with that. And so you have to be comfortable with what goes along with that? And it's okay to say, look, I don't know what, what, is, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna announce you? Are you changing it? You need to be comfortable and the client needs to be receptive and, and open to explaining it and not getting offended if the vendor does not know. So, and again, like I said, originally, it goes back to who you are as a person and your acceptance versus tolerance of people. So mm -hmm. that is something you can't be taught. You have to work on that yourself. And honestly, that, you framed it in a really beautiful way that I hope um, people are paying attention to is being willing um, to be open, to be wrong, and to be uncomfortable. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a, lot of, a lot of people are not willing to be uncomfortable, and that can really be a barrier to being open to anybody, straight Black people, Black right. trans people, like anybody, like the first step is you really got to do that internal work. So I think you posed that brilliantly. I'm going to throw it back to Michael and Lawrence. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's get an origin story going here. Oh. What, <laughs> what led you to create Black Gay Weddings? What was, what was that experience of, of getting to the creation of Black Gay Weddings like for y'all? Hmm. Um, well, it's a long story. I'll try to be as brief as I can be or to, to sum it up. Um, well, um, it all started out like this. We had our wonderful, we had a special day and um, it came time for uh, the pictures to come back and we were trying to decide you know, who we would feel comfortable with sharing our photos with. 
um, we started looking for examples of, you know, things will, well, let me, let me go back. I'm sorry. Let me, my nerves. Y'all yeah. pray with me. Yeah, amen. It all started when we started searching for examples of what we envisioned for our wedding day to look like or what we wanted it to be like. Um, after going through countless Pinterest pages and other like gay publications, we didn't see anybody that looked like us. That's just what it was. When we received the, uh, the photos and the videos uh, from our special day, we, um, we made the decision to share our love story with the world. Uh, we looked at uh, various media outlets to see who would be willing um, to share our story. And <laughs> there, there weren't a lot of options. So um, there was like a well-known gay media outlet for men who did feature our story. And there wasn't a lot of engagement, you know, after they posted it. Another um, bridal magazine for people of color featured us online as well as they featured us in print. And that's when the straight hate, as I like to call it, came from all directions. When we looked at the post and the comments and all the hateful rhetoric, it was nonstop. You would think they would have done a better job of moderating their feeds, but it got really, really ugly. And we got called things or said things to us like die fags, what a waste of a man. Um, I hope you get AIDS and die. It, it was horrible. And um, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> we, um, we searched many of the, um, the gay feeds, uh, gay media feeds that are already out there. And, um, you know, we realized that we're grossly underrepresented. Um, LGBTQ um, I plus couples of color aren't on, you know, the mainstream media pages. For every 40 to 50 posts, here's our diversity couple. Check. That's all they do. <laughs> Just checking boxes. So we feel like media outlets should take responsibility for protecting couples that they choose to feature. And, and that's just the bottom line. And at Black Gay Weddings, we, uh, we've created an outlet uh, where LGBTQI plus couples of color can trust us enough uh, to share their love stories. Um, we've created a platform where our community allies can safely and confidently showcase their, uh, their clients. And couples are sharing their most loving and caring parts of their celebrated relationships with us. And it is important to us at Black Gay Weddings and the Black Gay Weddings Community Network for us to protect them, so. Yeah. Um, the thing that's wild to me is that on a day about your love, you had to contend with barriers other couples just don't. Um, something that's supposed to be joyous, something that's supposed to be fun and, 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 and loving and good. Um, you had to go through something traumatic and it just, it still just blows my mind that I know your story is not the only one. Um, and I, I'm sorry that you had to go through that, but something you've created something beautiful out of it. You've created a community out of it. Um, and I think it's really important for the people that are listening to be mindful of uh, the ways that they are complicit in erasure. When we don't talk about uh, Black gay couples, when we don't talk about Black trans couples, when we don't show everybody in love, you begin to get this story that y'all don't exist, like y'all are unicorns or something, right. and you're not. And that's <laughs> uh, how it goes. 20,000 people following your Instagram account, you have nothing but submissions that you're sorting through. So it's not like, <sighs> <laughs> right. You know, it, it, it's just, it's, it, okay, I'm trying not to get mad on your behalf. <laughs> don't, don't get mad. Don't, don't get mad. I, we did enough of that, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also realizing like, this isn't a call out, right? This is yeah. a call up. Exactly. This is taking people to, to understand like, you're here and you're valid and you need to be visible, right? right yeah. so thank you for sharing that really, really tough moment. I'm so sad that you had to go through that. It was completely unnecessary, but I'm grateful that you created space for people, everybody in the Black queer experience to be Absolutely. seen and loved. And valid. Can, can I just say one thing? And I know this is kind of off. Um, no, you're fine. Um, because I still get a little upset about it because it was our day and 
I didn't think that we were going to wake up to that. And um, we did write to the editor um, and we, to, to the people who would like control that particular page. And we expressed to them how it made us feel. And all we really wanted was for them to speak out and just say, we don't tolerate this. We understand that when you put yourself out there that you're subject, you're gonna be subject to something. Not everybody's gonna agree with you. It's like being a politician. Not everybody's gonna agree with their platform or how you feel, but, but the fact that we trusted something precious to you and then this, this was the outcome and you never came out and said, we don't tolerate this type of discrimination. So I'm sorry, I didn't no, no. Oh, do not apologize. That needs to be heard. Um, and I think it's really important for the people who are here, who are in charge of content marketing, who are in charge of social, whether it be for their company or a publishing um, outlet, like these types of things that you may see as inconsequential carry a lot of weight for people. And it's important um, to not erase people it's just, you, you can't do that, especially in our industry. Um, thank you again. I'm going to shift uh, back to Braun. Um, how have you had to combat, you were talking earlier about like, the first thing people see is, is your skin color. Mm -hmm. How have you had to combat the perception of you as soon as you walk through the door um, versus the reality amongst industry peers, not, not even clients, people who are in business in the wedding industry. How have you had to combat that? So I have prided myself on being extremely well-spoken. And because I know that about myself, when I approach someone and the moment I open my mouth, they're quenching their, their eyes and just trying to like, like, like I'm about to come out of my mouth with something that is not proper English. So it starts there. It starts the moment I walk up, the moment I approach certain groups. What does he say? Oh, oh, he's well-spoken. Yes, yes, he's well-spoken. So we deal with that. I also deal with the perception that I'm going to have an attitude or that I'm not going to be easy to work with or that I'm not going to be a great collaborative partner or I might not understand the design. And so I have prided myself on a ballroom style presentation, but because my business exists in the former capital of the Confederacy, Richmond, Virginia, I cannot not work with Smilax and Ely Agnes and all the other pretty trailing greens that my peers have to work with. I can do it just as well, if not better, but simply because I am a Black man. And now I'm saying a black gay man, not that that is a new thing, but I'm embracing that and it's becoming 100% of who I am. Those are some of the things that we deal with. I, 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 sometimes I'm absolutely flabbergasted at the responses to my industry peers when I bring to their attention that, hey, do you realize that that vendor team is not diverse? Hey, do you realize you put these packages together? I may have worked your largest floral budget in history, but I'm not on your preferred vendors list. And I've only worked with you that one time. Something has to give people. And so these are some of the things that I experienced from my peers. And, in all, and the saddest part of it all is a lot of times is from peers that know me. It's peers that who have been around me. And for some odd reason, we as a community cannot let down our power struggles and our lack of willingness to share the pot and the experiences. We got to let that go, folks. Now is the time. I hope that the person that needed to hear that is on this webinar. And if not, I hope they catch it on the replay. Me being a college educated, former educator, and a well-spoken business owner, you don't have to squint to hear what I'm saying. You don't have to assume that I don't know how to work in light and airy palettes and that I can't do fine art style designing without foam. I can do it all. You just have to get to know my story to figure it out. Yeah. Ugh. And that's your responsibility to get to know my story, by the way. Exactly. Exactly. And all of those microaggressions that Absolutely. you just listed 
are things that come from people not checking their own bias, right? Oh, no. let me tell you. You know, Jordan, I'll give you a quick segue. So I had the privilege, have the privilege of speaking on a lot of stages in this industry. And mm -hmm. without question, every single time I speak on a national stage, there is at least one person who leaves the feedback too self-absorbed presentation was too much about him. Well, who in the heck else am I supposed to talk about when I'm trying to coach you on how to improve your business based on my business experience and prowess? It's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's coming from a place of being a successful business person that is on the stage speaking to you. So yeah. The automatic perception is that I'm arrogant, I'm self-absorbed, simply because I had a preview video created to talk about my passion about flowers. Shame on me, right? Oh, but uh, so many things that you don't, other people don't see, other people don't have to get over, other people don't have to navigate, just for you to get on the stage, right? Like, oh, okay. I'm trying not to get angry, y'all. I'm trying to be There's loving. No life. place for anger. We all right. Look, we're we're, 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 in, we're we're talking to the fam. Okay, um, April, I want to shift down um, to you and ask you, uh, kind of going against that same grain of your industry peers. How have you have you ever, excuse me, been treated by vendors or clients or clients' families? differently because you are a black queer woman and how did you navigate that um so going back to the first question you asked i haven't um had that experience with my clients just because again those are people that i make sure that i have that relationship with and that um i'm ver they're very supportive of me just like i'm very supportive of them mm -hmm. um before i started my own business and i was working in a um, corporate event, planning environment, I definitely had those experiences, um, especially navigating the fact that, you know, I'm a queer woman, I'm a black woman, and I'm a woman, period, so I'm a minority um, in an industry that is, you know, very white. So mm -hmm. oftentimes, am I stuck? Am I good? Mm -hmm. You're good. You're good. Okay. Just checking. Um, so oftentimes, you know, I have been one of two, if that, um, or even just a few, a handful of Black people in, in very large companies. So um, navigating the three of those, you know, once they um, discover or find out that I'm married to a woman, it, it becomes kind of distracting for people. And, um, and they sometimes they just don't know how to wrap their heads around it. And, and I feel like I've been like treated kind of like an oddity because they're just like, huh, you don't look gay because they, people have this, um, this idea of what a gay person is supposed to look like. And I don't fit that stereotype. And my life, you know, is for the lack of better words. I mean, it's regular. My relationship is regular. There's nothing out of the ordinary. Um, I'm in a very loving marriage and um, we're both very successful and, and it's just, I felt like people kind of were like, hmm, like I'm in the circus, like really? Wow. Um, so that's definitely been a thing. I've, I've had coworkers um, make comments like, oh, you know, you're um, whatever you want to call it, you know, referring to my wife. And I'm just like, she's my wife. You can, you can call her that. There's a, you know, and you know, oftentimes it is ignorance. Sometimes I feel like it's willful ignorance and, um, you know, it's okay if you're unaware of these things and, and you want to learn to just ask questions. But um, when you say things like that, it's hurtful and it comes across um, really shady. So, um, you know, I feel like in these corporate environments, being in an environment where I, I'm able to share these things and they're addressed, um appropriately has been an issue as well just not having the space um to go to hr and be like hey this person has said these things to me that are like blatantly discriminatory um 
I'm glad that I don't have to deal with that now because I have control over my business, but I know that there are a lot of people that feel the same way that I did. Um, and I think it's really important for, you know, managers and the HR departments to really make sure that their team members are educated on how to not treat people like this, how to avoid misgendering people, just really having that sensitivity training um, so that they are more aware. I can't, I'm never surprised by this, but just the fact that somebody referred to your wife that way. <laughs> I mean, Ugh. just adding one more thing, it's just also the, it, there's just a lot of insults too that come along with it. I mean, maybe you haven't met the right guy or, you know, th things like that. Have you been abused? And it's just like, these are things that you would never say to anybody um, and you would never disrespect the relationship um, and make these um, these assumptions and you don't do this when it's a heterosexual um, relationship so don't disrespect my relationship my relationship is just as strong just as valid as anyone else's and um, people really need to stop viewing um, like our queer relationships as this oddity because it's not yeah. And I think that goes back to uh, what we were saying with, with Michael and Lawrence is like, when you don't see yourself, people assume that you don't exist, that erasure, right? And so uh, that plays perfectly into that. Um, and I want to shift over to Jamel and ask a question um, because it, you offer counseling as well um, with, with your services as an officiant. Is there a way that the industry can better serve uh, the mental health, aiding in the mental health of Black queer couples as they're planning their wedding? Yes, uh, they can actually do a little research and they can realize that same-sex couples are not the same as heterosexual couples. Uh, they need to update their contracts, their websites, and other things to reflect things like groom one and groom two rather than bride and groom. Um, it's so frustrating for couples to see, you know, just those two choices. Um, Same-sex marriage was made legal throughout the country over five years ago, so do a little research. Also, do not assume anything. Ask. Don't assume just because the bride is choosing to wear a suit that she won't be escorted down the aisle by her father. Don't assume that the couple's vision of their day is clear and drawn out because a lot of same-sex couples never thought they would be able to marry the love of their lives, so they didn't spend time dreaming about their wedding day and putting towels on their heads, pretending to veils and things like that, so be patient and be helpful. Um, ask who will be present at the wedding prior to setting up seating charts and processionals with uh, mother of the bride or father of the groom or things like that. Uh, these significant players unfortunately may not be present for their big day, so just show a little sensitivity. So true story, um, before we got married, we went to a bridal show and at the registration table, we were asked, uh, so who's the bride? And we said, well, we both are. They're like, oh, so you're having a joint wedding? I said, no. I said, we're marrying each other. And not only did it just happen at the registration table, it, it happened at several booths that we went to. And that is extremely, extremely discouraging. So just have people do a little research and be sensitive. Basic tact shouldn't elude people, but for some reason it does sometimes. Like, just right. The thing that's wild is some people are like, oh, I don't, oh, that's, there's so many terms and that's just so difficult. And really what's being asked is not difficult at all. Right. It's very simple, but people still struggle with it. And it's important to create a space where Black queer couples can feel safe and not like they have to come out. To, like you were basically having to come out to every vendor at right. that show. And that's not what you signed up for. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Go ahead, Mike, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. Yeah, Jordan, if I, could, if I could just jump in on that. If you don't take anything else away from today, gender neutralize your intake forms. All right, gender neutralize your intake forms and gender, gender neutralize yourselves, you know, because it's a whole thought process that needs to be changed. I had to put that in there. It, it was a no, 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 <laughs> and you're right. Like I just put couple, mm -hmm. partner, like it's not hard y'all. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not. Go ahead. Can I add one?
thing. I, I think you just have a really, really good point. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but as queer people, we have to come out constantly. And especially in, the in, in our industry, I feel like, um, you know, going back to what I was saying about the, the work experience, I always felt like I had to make sure, you know, I found a way to slide in the fact like, hey, yeah, I'm married, my wife, or blah, 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 into the conversation because when I didn't want to take a job that wasn't okay with that, um, and I wanted to be upfront from the very beginning, and I do that with my clients, I've done that in the past with job interviews, and, you know, it's, it sucks that we have to do that. We shouldn't have to feel like, hey, just sliding this in there to make sure that, you know, there's no funny business going on here and that you're actually, you know, inclusive. Um, so I think that's, that's oftentimes, you know, I'm comfortable, but a lot of people aren't. And I feel like that's a, that's a big stressor for people having to make sure and vet everyone that they deal with and that they're around to make sure that they're open. So... I think you bringing up that up was really, really big. And, and truthfully, the thing that's so interesting about this conversation, I think, is understanding that when we talk about the queer experience and we talk about all the letters and LGBTQIA, like there's learning that L can learn about I and A can learn about B, you know, there's all these different ways. And it really just comes down to what Kim originally said have a conversation, be willing to listen, be willing to listen, right? And just treat people the way that they want to be treated. It's just basic stuff, but whew, sorry, you know, some people struggle. Let me get back to the questions. Let me get back to questions. I promise I'll, I'll be on my best behavior. Um, Michael and Lauren, I want to know this because y'all have been, y'all have already been doing the work. Y'all have already had a pretty big following, but I feel like June just took y'all to another level. What was the difference in the response to your brand before June and, and, and now? Well, um, we've definitely been getting more interest in what we're doing at Black Gay Weddings and more people are realizing that we, that we're here and they love seeing this beautiful representation of couples of color. So we're going to be, we're here to stay. We're not going anywhere. So for those of you all who trying to run us up out of there, <laughs> ain't going to happen, boo. We getting bigger and we're going to be better. So now I, I'm a techie. So, um, you know, I've always been watching the data. Um, the engagement rates. Um, and I noticed a jump. Um, it went from an average of 85% uh, uh, follower engagement rate before June 5th, uh, Juneteenth uh, to 120% afterwards. Um, our weekly visits have also increased to about an average of uh, 786,000 visitors. Um, people are woke. And uh, they're woke to the reality that couples of color do get married. We do exist. And, and we have some fierce weddings, baby. Some <laughs> fierce weddings. Yes, I said it. Ain't no cups and plates around here. No. <laughs> People plates so up, funny, rather. <laughs> so I, just, I, I, I love that. I love knowing that because it's like, it's not like you just started to exist you've been doing this for a while um, and I'm glad that people are finally starting to really pay attention in the ways that they need to because everything that y'all have got planned and everything that you're already doing is so beautiful. Um, I think I want to jump back to Jamel. Okay, so let me get my questions, my question back up. I'm so sorry. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is Sometimes you get that resistance or pushback. I think Kim was talking about, you know, people unfollowing or, you know, um, Michael was talking about people leaving really, really nasty comments on, on their wedding pictures. Do you ever get any resistance or pushback for serving the LGBTQIA community? And how do you navigate that when it happens? Because I know if is not even, a, how do you navigate it when it happens? <laughs> Actually, you know, you would uh, be surprised with me living in the deep south. Georgia is deep south. Um, if anything, I've actually felt more supported and um, I've acquired more clients and businesses because I do serve the LGBTQ plus mm -hmm. community. Now, though I do specialize in same-sex marriages, I marry more straight Caucasian couples than anybody. Mm -hmm. 
Um, they choose me because of my diversity and my inclusiveness. Um, I've actually had couples tell me that they chose me because I am a black woman. Mm. Yes, straight white couples have chosen me because I am a black woman. Now, sometimes, uh, usually older people, um, older black people at weddings who love their child or their grandchild who's getting married, but they haven't educated themselves, they'll approach me at weddings for some reason. You know, they'll feel comfortable to tell me that they don't really understand this gay stuff and that this isn't how things were done in their day or whatever. They assume because I'm officiating that I'm a pastor or a preacher or something like that. So I listen and I smile and I nod. And then I introduce them to my wife. I let them know that um, I'm not just one of those gay friendly vendors. I'm actually a card holding member. So um, yeah, so I don't really uh, receive a lot of pushback, which is, and it could be because I live in Atlanta and Atlanta is, you know, pretty diverse, but I haven't received any. So cross my fingers for that. Yes, I hope you never receive any. And honestly, that's such a, there's always a well-meaning parent, you know, who hasn't quite got there yet. But uh, I appreciate your patience, <laughs> patience and candor, because it's, it, it's needed. Thank you. I appreciate it. It really, I just like to see the look on her face when my six foot one wife walks up and, you know, stands next to me and I smile. So, yeah. It's like, mm. yeah, exactly. Oh, goodness. Uh, okay. I'm going to throw it back to our other, it, the way that y'all are shown on my panel, it's like, we're all the South over here, even though sometimes y'all don't claim Texas. It's okay. It's fine. Um, Kim, what would you, and this is a perfect segue from what we were just talking about with uh, Jamel, for people, parents, vendors who don't understand or who don't fully get it when they're talking about like, well, I don't understand, uh, you know, gay stuff or, you know how people always say things like, like Jamel, like you were just saying, nobody was gay back in my day. <laughs> right. It's not new, right? Um, I guess it's the, I mean, you know, as a nurse, I have been called out my name and I'm the nurse. I've walked in a room and um, there's the white girl that's me and then they'll say, look at the white girl and start talking. I'm like, I'm the nurse, she's an aide. Um, it's the same thing. It, you can't change certain behaviors and beliefs and you have to educate people and correct them, especially elderly. I've had um, a, a lesbian couple, but they were interracial. So the families didn't meet each other until the wedding and everybody was worried about grandma, but grandma stayed on the dance floor all night and didn't have a problem. It was the parents who met each other, but they all got along. But you know, one aunt kept saying, you know, she's pretty for a color girl. And I was like, we don't use colored anymore, but you know, it's correction. You know, it's not, um, those are things, you know, like you said, Jamel's in Georgia, I'm in Louisiana, I'm in New Orleans. New Orleans is a little bit different. We're a little more progressive than the rest of the state. Um, so my experiences aren't, I don't have that many horrible experiences, but I do have experiences a lot with families. And I had a mother once tell me, well, I don't want to see my son kiss another man. And I, so what can you do about it? I was like, close your eyes. Ain't nothing I can do about it. Oh, what, what are you talking about? Like, what do you want me to do? I mean, and so one of the grooms said, do you know what I do with your son? And I was like, see, you went too far. You didn't have to tell a woman that. But okay, you told her that. So we just going <laughs> to, you know, I'm comfortable. So, and I have a mouth, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flamboyant. Michael tells you that all the time. I'm flamboyant. So I, I, I answer people the same way I would answer a racist. I just can't make you understand, but you don't have the right to treat people badly. And there's a certain thing called tech. Some things just not in your business and you just shouldn't ask inappropriate questions and you should be comfortable. I don't know how you can make somebody understand things. I can't fix that for you. You need to figure that out. And in my, and years ago, I changed all of my literature, emails, question, you know, questionnaires. So I, I'm very comfortable. I, I don't use certain pronouns. I will say the couple. And then I ask people, you have to just ask people. I mean, I, the biggest thing is, and I do tell vendors, don't exploit couples also, which is another thing. Oh, I finally got a, a gay couple. You know, don't exploit people. Don't try to get a couple just to add that into your, uh, you know, my thing. And it's nothing wrong with diversifying your business, but people know we ain't genuine, like I said before. And so in New Orleans, we're a little more progressive, so it's not as bad. 
but I deal with everything, interracial couples, I deal with that. And like Jamel say, they will hire me. They like working with black women. So hopefully that's our next VP. But even with that said, I don't have the answers for that. Um, understanding, I think that's personal. Um, I think you need to put in the work. You need to educate yourself. And um, if you're still worried about it and you're still struggling with that, then that's something personal. I don't, you know, I, I just don't know what else anyone can do to help you if you're not willing to, to get involved. I don't, I don't understand what else needs to be done about that. I'm like, Jamel, I do try to talk to families. I do refer my couples for counseling just because I think everyone needs it. I've had couples who got married and called me back late and said we're struggling. I say, same problems with any couple. You need to go to counseling. I mean, and if you're struggling finding someone, I have, I have a bride who is a counselor. And when I have couples who come to me, I refer all of them to her. Um, and so, you know, I tell clients, put in the work, people who are trying to understand, I, I don't know how you, I don't know how you do that for them. I don't, I don't have an answer for it. I don't. And the thing is, that's funny to me is that people will use the excuse of, well, I need to understand in order to respect another person and you don't need to understand and order understand. people just respect people right it's not again y'all it's not that hard but we know that some people struggle um <laughs> some people just struggle and we've been having really good conversations that are happening in the chat and i just wanted to bring up a point somebody had um daniela said couples know when they're being tokenized and kimmy brought up such a good point you know, I've heard I've heard photographers say, I really want to break into the the gay wedding market. And I'm like, it's not a secret club. What are you <laughs> what are you talking? What are you talking about? Uh, but people do know when they're being tokenized, people do know when it's not authentic. And I think it's really important. Going back to what we said at the beginning, be willing to 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 listen, be willing to have the conversation. And it's better to ask than to make that assumption. So I want to uh, head over to April and you touched on this a little bit, but what assumptions have people made about you um, in the corporate space, in the wedding industry, um, just in general, again, like when Bron said, when they see the skin, but also when you express your identity fully, what assumptions have people made about you? Um, I feel like I touched on that a little bit already. Um, it's, they assume that, oh, something must have happened. I must have had a bad relationship with a guy. And then, um, and that's why I dated women. Um, and they just can't seem to grasp it. And it becomes very, very distracting for them. And, and it's unfortunate because there's so many aspects to me. There's so many parts of my personality that are worth focusing on. And that's just such a small, I mean, think about it. You don't focus on a straight or heterosexual person's relationship or their sexual orientation. It's just like, okay, cool. That's just like background noise. And it's the same, it should be the same way for us. Like why, is that what you focus on? You know, um, I feel like, you know, in these environments that I've been in, like I said before, I've been oftentimes the only black girl, oftentimes the only um, queer person. And I mean, I've had, I flat out have had someone come to me and, and they're saying something and they said, you people. And I'm like, are you referring to black people or gay people? Because literally I'm the only one, you know what I mean? So really trying to navigate like this, this line, because there's, there's, dim dip, uh, sorry, <laughs> there's discrimination um, on both ends, you know, and then there's the, the classic assumptions that we've already assumed. My wife, she must be the man, you know what I mean? And um, my wife is, very comfortable in you know who she is and I'm glad that she doesn't get offended by these things but it's not that's not the case and it, and it shouldn't be something that that comes up in, in your work environment it, like you said it's tapped it's that's not something that we need to be discussing um and, and it's offensive to make those assumptions so it's Again, it's wild to me because so often you'll hear people say, oh, especially like in a lot of the 
everything that has come out from our industry in the past like month, you will hear people talk about the queer community in this corner and the black community in this corner. And I'm like, but there are black queer people. <laughs> are you, you can't just erase them either. And they're getting both sides of it. Like you said, when that person was like, you people, which. Yeah. I just, I didn't know what she was referring to. I mean, I've also, you know, my wife, you know, for our wedding, she wore a suit. My wife likes tight clothes. She like, and everyone's like, why is she wearing this suit? Why is she trying to be a man? And I'm just like, why are you assuming that someone's clothes mean that they're trying to be a man? Like women wear suits all the time. Like where it's just, you know, it's really just clearing yourself of these preconceived notions, these stereotypes and being really, really receptive and actually listening to who your clients are and, and your friends and your peers. Um, and it's not just for the vendors. It's not just for our allies. It's also for us too, because when I'm personally dealing with my LGBTQIA couples, you know, sometimes I have to check myself and make sure that I'm not making assumptions about them based on my own personal experiences. So it's not something like, oh, you've reached this point where you're just like, okay, great. I checked off the box. I'm an ally. I, I got this. No, it's really a constant thing that you have to be aware of and you have to be mindful of and because every single person is different. Nobody's the same. There's so much overlap. There's no boxes. And you really, really, really have to be aware of that and constantly work at it with every single client that you have. And also, that is a great note to everybody listening. Being an ally, you don't get a pin and it's done, right? It's constant education. It's constantly learning. And it's basically constantly learning how we can be better to each other. That's the heart of it. How can we be better? How can we serve better? It's That's really what it is. Um, so thank you for that answer. And I think I want to close out with the flower guy, Braun. Um, with our last uh, question that we have for you before we transition into the Q&A. I see that we have a lot of questions in the Q&A and I want to make sure we have time for that. Um, in what ways do you feel like you were talking about being on the stage and people looking past you, right? In what ways do you feel like your talent has been overlooked because of your identity? Yeah, but, you know, there are so many opportunities to be creative in our industry. And I kind of gauge, you know, um, gauge how I'm going to answer your question based on how many people um, come to me and ask me to participate and collaborate. So I wouldn't say that my talent has been overshadowed, but the opportunities to display my talent has been, have not been given. Um, however, you know, I, I use that as a learning opportunity um, in my market to show like, hey, folks, I'm, I'm at this venue and I hate the venue shame, but, you know, we've worked so hard to work at the highest caliber of production as possible. And then I think about all of the events that are taking place in these venues that I have dripped all over and have dripped on them in a way that have never been dripped. Let me tell you, um, there, there are some private, heavily racist clubs in my market. There are so many venues that have never looked better until my team, my black team, touched it and transformed it. And to think that those opportunities that, that I can bring 50K and more of flowers to a venue and I'm still not good enough to be on your preferred vendors list. So it's not that the talent is overlooked. They're very aware of how talented all of us are. There's no question. We've been doing this for a very long time. Who was setting the table 150 years ago? I'm just saying, we have been at the height of hospitality since we have been brought over against our own will. So, that's the answer to the question. I know I don't went off, but the reality is it's not, it's not that the talent is overlooked. It's simply that the opportunities to display that talent are overshadowed. 
Bron, when I tell you, I almost jumped up and started doing a, a hot step like I was in church. It's all the truth, isn't it, Jordan? This, that is, you gave us context. You gave us history. <laughs> you gave us perspective. I gave you all my story. And I yeah. think that the more people that hear all of our stories, mm -hmm. because we're not the only creative Black people in our industry, when you start to hear the stories and you start to really peel back that onion, you'll see that I am not making this up. When you look at your preferred vendors list at your, at your coveted venues, I want you to start thinking about how many opportunities are brown vendors, gay vendors, and, and purple vendors. I don't care who you are other than the majority, which has been white women. Mm -hmm. If it's not more than white women, then we need to take a deeper look at that and answer the question, why? Yeah, yeah. And I wanna and add to I, that too, Brian. Yes, please, Kim. So, you know, in New Orleans, um, it, it, it's, it's, that's how it is. We're the number two destination for weddings behind Vegas. Um, we do conventions, lots of events all year. Mardi Gras, the biggest party ever. Essence Fest, and these are Black events. Um, Bayou Classic, Southern and Gramlin. All of the vendors are white in a predominantly Black city. Now that's changing with our new mayor. My business partner and I are working on a lot of different events and stuff, but I hear what you're saying. I took the classes, I got the certifications, and then mm -hmm. when I go to a venue and I ask them for their new pricing list and I see the preferred vendor list attached and nobody is a person of color, any inclusion period, and I'm saying, but then when you post, they want to say, why you don't tag me? Because you don't advertise me. When clients come in, do you say to them, go to my company for services? But mm -hmm. when I come in, you want me to share pictures and you want me to tag you on social media. I'm mm -hmm. not going to advertise for you at all. So, you know, things are changing in New Orleans because of our mayor and you see her on TV. So, you know, my mayor and, um, and we're working on some other productions. So my business partner and I, she's, um, you know, one of the, she's my partner. She's one of the biggest LGBTQ openly gay activists in our community and we're working on some events like our music awards and a whole bunch of other stuff but we decided okay you don't have we, we call it the tyler perry approach you don't have to invite me to the table i'm going to make my own table and if i choose to let you in then i will and the <laughs> problem with it is the largest production company here is a white gay man hmm. and we are not let in and i don't understand that why you discriminate against us Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. So, you know, we're ch it's changing in New Orleans. Our mayor is busting a lot of that up, the old establishment. And it's going to take some time, but we, we're here and they yeah. see us. And so I'm like you, I will not tag the venue unless I have a good relationship. And that mm -hmm. is the most insulting thing in the world to get an email with your pricing and you have preferred vendor list. And I brought probably five or six weddings. I've been invited to brunches as a thank you to the planners who bring business. And I've been the only person of color in the room besides the wait staff. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here listening to them talk about these boring weddings and I'm like, what? And you know, so I understand you. So it's beyond just that. It's about inclusion for our color. And then you just don't see it. Like I had the conversation, we don't have florists. We don't have a lot of gay vendors. Why? Mm -hmm. We're one of the biggest locations for events in the country in the world, in New Orleans. Yeah. And I Brian, I think you want to On a piggyback, on a piggyback, on a piggyback, if I can piggyback. <laughs> that is so silly. Okay, so, so I know that most of us listening, and I can only imagine that the panelists have experienced this. This is a nut, going back to the question you asked me about um, my talent and the exposure and you know, what it has or hasn't gotten. Uh, I, can think, I can think of countless times that I have been in ballrooms and there have been flowers from window to wall. Everywhere you could have a surface, there were flowers. And I have watched venue staff give active tours to prospective clients. During your day. And, <laughs> and I have seen the interest in the client's eyes as they try to get to me in the ballroom. 
to get a card or to compliment. And I have watched body language. I have watched people gesture and move those folk out of that room to not meet me. It has been even as explicit. I have had people give a tour in my ballroom because it's mine until I give it back to you. You're in my ballroom giving, giving a tour and the cake display is out. The baker is not there. I'm there. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they walked that couple over to me to introduce them to the florist that was serving that day? No. But did they walk the couple over to an empty cupcake stand and talk about how great the cupcake baker is? You want to talk about, a, that's not a microaggression, that's a macroaggression. Macro. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have, we have gotten really comfortable with the word microaggression, but a lot of this stuff is right in our faces. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with y'all, it hurts my feelings. And I hope you care that you hurt my feelings, because you are mm -hmm. going to be accountable for how you made me feel. Mm -hmm. One way or the and that's other. why I love the Black Gay Weddings platform, because it's showcasing and giving clients and I met Michael through the, my business partner years ago and you know we talked about all the ins and outs and even going to other black platforms and not being supported and now here on their platform there's an opportunity for all of that for vendors where people can go and find officiants where they can go and find any city any state around and they can go and purposely be intentional with their spending with people who are accepting and including them and who are making sure that they are giving them the experience that they deserve and they can spend their money intentionally. So I thank them and applaud them for this platform because it is overdue and needed. Mm -hmm. And we tried it on other platforms, no shade, but it's where it's needed. And I hate that they had the experience with the experience, but from that, they were able to make something beautiful from it. So mm -hmm. I appreciate them for that. Mm, Y'all touched on some good points. I think, Michael, you raised your hand. You wanted to say something? Is your mic? No, I was just hallelujah and amen. I went to church. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was my no. amen. <laughs> no, no, no. Because, I mean, Braun laid it down perfectly. Because even as you're, you're listing this out, I'm going back in my head to experiences that I have had. And I'm a, a straight Black woman of where I realized and tell people until people realize I wasn't just the help, but I'm the the captain of the ship. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. okay. And that, that, that hurts your soul, right? That, like you said, that hurts your feelings and it shouldn't be that way. Um, and I just, oh, I'm this conversation, y'all brought out so many great points, but I do want to transition over to the questions that some of the attendees were able to ask. And let me see if I can pull those up. Awesome. Okay. So, oh, we got a lot of questions. Okay. Let me go. And good questions too, right? Mm -hmm. These are well thought out questions. Oh Lord, y'all. Have you encountered or been approached by people of the trans experience? I, I, this is open to anybody who wants to answer. Well, I'll jump out there. No, I haven't. And I have, um, I'm coming to the realization that I'm at the crossroads of being black and gay. And a trans person is at so many more crossroads. And I've seen, you know, people in the comment section talking about classism. When you think about how trans people have been treated throughout history, it's, it's absolutely deplorable. So I can only imagine that there's so many trans couples out here that are scared to showcase their love because of what similar to how what Lawrence um, and Michael experienced. So I haven't, and I'm just imagining that that could play a major factor into why we have not seen um, as many um, trans couples celebrated um, in media. Um, we we do have some experience um, in that arena. Um, one of our closest and dearest friends is trans and actually going through the process and is very active uh, here um, with us at Black Gay Weddings. And um, I'm learning as well. There are a lot of things about the community that I'm starting to learn. And I, you know, I love learning new things and especially learning about our community and this entire movement. And uh, 
if I can shout Nehru out because I know she's he's on. Um, get me Nehru because working with me on my pronouns. See, that's that's important. So yes, um, and we, we do have trans couples. Uh, not very many, but a few on our on our page. Can I can I add something? That was a really good moment to show other people who are trying to be allies to this community that you're not always going to get it right, right? Right. That's okay. Like so many people don't even want to start because like oh, I don't want to. Oh, I don't. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to get it wrong. You're gonna get it wrong because you're learning, right? And that's okay keep trying because these couples need you. So I, I appreciate that. And we that are going to have Nehru on. So, mm -hmm. yes. I'm excited. Um, Nehru, thank you so much for asking that question. And then, um, I'm sorry, but you, you asked like a piggyback to that. How have you helped th those trans couples overcome obstacles when it comes to weddings? Um, what are some ways, I'm kind of going to piggyback, what are some ways that you can think of now that if a trans couple came to you, um, that you could help them overcome some of those obstacles based on your own experiences. You want to answer that? Um, well, I, I, I have some great answers, uh, but Nehru, you know that since, uh, you know, this is a public conversation, no information can be shared without a non-disclosure agreement <laughs> at this time. <laughs> I, I'm trying to uh, to keep it politically correct. We're not. Yeah, we there. There are a lot of programs and a lot of projects and initiatives that we are going to bring to the table. That's going to be perfect for our entire community. Yeah. All right. And the and the trans community especially. Yeah. And that's a really good point too. When we talk so many times, it gets lost in. I think right after. Uh, the Supreme Court ruling, it got branded as, you know, marriage equality and just, just gay couples, no. right? But we erased everybody. L, B, T, I, and A. And <laughs> no, right. it's everybody. We want all the letters. Just don't y'all add no more letters because then I, I won't have enough space on the flag. So y'all, you know, don't do me so silly. Oh. Well, you can't, you can't block no letters. <laughs> you starting a whole <laughs> argument with the wrong. Book. I started something else. Okay, let me stop. Right. I love, I love that though, because um, you like, like Bron said, you want to be inclusive um, across all these different experiences. Um, okay, I want to get to the next question. Have you felt that as a person of color, you have been boxed into a certain preconceived, uh, preconceived notion of aesthetic and that it has hindered your business? Furthermore, do you feel that people automatically assume you will not understand your client's cultural needs when they approach you for your business? How do you overcome these hurdles? Bron, I think you touched on that a little bit. Oh, I could talk about this all day. Um, <laughs> I, I have several planners that um, I work with pretty regularly. And all of them know that I'm a, I call myself a chameleon designer. I can design just about any palette and with any material. So, but my website is, is more projecting what I want to do more and what can really pay my bills, which is larger scale design. Mm -hmm. So I have a few planners that, you know, market to one particular, one type of couple, and it's a majority look. And um, I've heard her say, you know, like, oh, I know that they would have loved you if I'd have got them in, but, you know, they were more attracted to this person's website than yours. You know, so maybe if you put a few more pictures of, you know, this, that, and the other, I'm like, but you knew that I was a better fit, but you weren't willing to put your neck on the line to advocate and say, oh, I understand his website might not align with exactly the look you're going with, but you got to meet him. You got to meet him because if you meet him, then he'll be able to explain to you ins and outs and ups and downs. And you'll know, he'll know more about the daggone subject matter than the expert fine art designer. So this stuff occurs left and right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Jamel had something. No? Oh, shit. I was actually just talking to my wife, um, just hey, commenting wife. on, um, <laughs> commenting on, on Bron's, uh, his statements and everything. Yeah. Yeah, you're awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that's a good point for people listening who are vendors, who, who are looking for ways to be better advocates. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're not talking about us, 
when these couples are in front of you, what are we, we're not in the room when this is happening, you know? Um, did anybody else want to answer that or could I move to the next question? Oh, we're good for the next question? Okay. Um, can you talk a bit more about language when referring to clients? Example, husband, wife, bridegroom, partner, non-binary. How can we do a better job of inclusive packaging, inclusive language, excuse me, on our packaging? Well, I, I will answer that. I mean, I've changed all of my paperwork years ago. Um, and it, it shouldn't be a new thing to anyone today. Everyone should have already made those changes. Um, I don't use he or she. I put the couple, even my contracts, my attorneys have done. I think most people have gotten that together, even in corporate America, and people have gotten better with paperwork, insurance policies. I mean, all of that stuff is, um, even in healthcare, it's pretty much has changed, you know, um, and there will, they will still actually identify, but it's up to you. I don't see where there's, it's optional. And I've seen a huge change. I don't see a lot of that. I mean, there are still people, I guess, have not caught up, but I know most people have changed that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good answer. Um, okay, I want to move on to the next question. Okay. Do you find that many of the panels and specifically the black wedding vendors that have been asked to speak are mostly coming from the luxury world? Have you found anyone in the panels who addresses the exclusion of so many within our communities who can't access that luxury market, who gets most, which gets most of the attention? Jamel, you want to go? So um, I, I guess whenever I first started out, um, I was trying to target the um, people who were, um, I guess for lack of better terms, on a budget. So um, yeah, I, I did, um, you know, I marketed myself towards them, but um, as time went on and I got more exposure, I was you know, contacted by people who had, you know, higher caliber weddings at, you know, bigger venues or what have you. But um, I guess I, um, I didn't forget where I came from, you know, mm -hmm. so um, I still, I service everybody. Um, the, I guess one of the issues comes with, um, I, and I've met people like this. So my wife is also a wedding planner. And sometimes we do weddings together. People mm -hmm. will um, contact us and say, Oh, so I guess we're going to get the discount since we family. I'm like, no. I said, first of all, um, I have a shoe addiction, so I need my coins. And we, um, even though we work together sometimes, we, um, we're two separate businesses. Right. So that is the issue. The only issue that I, um, that I have encountered with, you know, some people, but there are some that, you know, they understand, you know, my, my prices are a bit higher than a lot of other officiants around here. And that's because of all the, you know, everything that I put into my business, all of the, um, all the experience that I have, the education. Um, I spend a lot on my money, on my business, because you got to spend money to make money. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, they understand that. So I work with them. Um, like if they can't afford to pay the uh, retainer up front, you know, if they want to break up the payments, absolutely do that. Let's break them up. We can do that. Um, I tell them I'm here to help make their experience, you know, memorable and, um, and, you know, a, a good thing for them not to break the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback just a little bit is, you know, I think that what has happened in our industry in terms of the, the buzzword luxury has really been detrimental to our industry right. and has created this have and have not philosophy where, you know, you have a 1% of our industry is ultra luxury and the rest of them are at the VFWs and the halls, okay? And I think that um, to be more specific, Carla, to your question, you know, I think that um, oftentimes in regards to this luxury conversation, we are assimilating 
And we have lost a lot of our value because we have been taught that this is what it needs to be. This is what it must look like in order for it to have value. And I think that luxury has become the determinant for value in our industry. And we have got to do a much better job at managing that. I have all but removed the word luxury from all of my marketing, regardless of the price points that I work in. I want to be known as the flower guy, which means he can serve anybody. So even though I have some price points in my head that might I might be wanting you to get to or for me to really feel like I can be as creative as possible, but the reality of the matter is that the flower guy, Brian, walks into the Jefferson Hotel just as proudly as he walks into the Hobson Lodge, okay? And I bring fire to the Hobson Lodge. So we gotta get rid of that luxury, that whole luxury thing and, and making that our moniker of success because it's bull crap, because luxury to me is a mindset. Luxury is a service. Luxury is not a venue or a price point. So Carla, I'm with you 100%. I think that we gotta do a much better job at managing expectations and finding a lot of joy in the work that we create without any strings attached, without worrying about the price point, without worrying about where we were. Let's just worry about, did we do our best work and were our clients satisfied? And the answer is yes, you're holy, you're good. And I, I want to just piggyback real quick. I agree with that. I think it's about the experience. And I tell my clients, it should feel good, taste good, smell good, look good, if it's not going to do that. And I talk clients off the ledge. And you'll read that even if you go to my website. I talk about the Pinterest overload and the in Instagram fame. And we know most people, that's a facade and it's not real. So I tell clients, look, you can still have the wedding of your dreams. You cannot invite 400 people. And we're doing better in the South about RSVPing. You can't show up to the airport without an RSVP. You can't get on the plane. If you didn't buy a ticket, they need to know you're coming so they can have a seat for you. So it's those type of conversations and educating people. And I tell people, you can have everything you want if you keep it intimate. Sometimes you can have an intimate wedding and I steer people to venues. If you want an all white wedding, we're not gonna go to a venue where we have to do construction. We're not interior decorators. And we know everybody has a budget. We may not have Oprah's budget, you know, Basil's budget, Bill Gates' budget, but we have a budget. And so you need to be realistic. And that small percentage, like Ron said, 1%, most people do not fall into the luxury luxury brand. So we need to you know, educate our people. And Instagram and Facebook has done a horrible job creating perceptions. And I was doing this before IG and FB. But we have to educate people that you can have the experience. And especially for my couples who... I love my couples and I get to know them, we become family. But I'm realistic and say, look, I don't make my staff work for free. I can't. They have families and stuff too. Let's be realistic, let's readjust this, and let's look at an alternative. And you have to set expectations and it can be done. So I, I, I allow everyone to make an appointment, a consultation. I don't have things if your budget's not this, but I do do a questionnaire because it helps me in my consultation and steering you in the right direction if you decide to hire me. It lets me know what I'm working with, and I'm realistic with people. This is yeah. what you need. and there's tons of venues to pick from for everyone. Yeah, and I wish we could get to all of the questions, but I really wanted to honor everybody's time here today. Um, thank you so much, everybody, all of our panelists. Thank you to Michael and Lawrence for creating this and having this idea and asking us to be on here. This was a beautiful conversation. Um, and I'm going to pass it to you all to close, but every, all of our attendees, thank you for showing up. All of our panelists, thank you. Thank you, Jordan. All of our social information is in our name. Please go follow us. Thank you again. I'm going to pass it off to Lawrence and Michael for the benediction. <laughs> <laughs> That's your boy number one and two. <laughs> uh -huh. Amen. <sighs> that was some good stuff. It really was. I think it was some really, some really good stuff. So with that, um, we just want to thank you, Jordan, and we want to thank each and every one of you for taking your time to join us in this discussion. And we also wanted uh, to, again, thank our awesome panel for providing their time, their expertise, uh, to help us address some of the uh, challenges we face as an LGBTQIA community of color. If you are interested in being a part of a future panel discussion, and you want to join our growing community of experts, please send us an email to info at blackgayweddings.com. Remember to join us again next week for part two, advocating for the community and each other. And again, I'm Michael Broughton. 
And I'm Lawrence Broughton. Until next time, keep, keep on, on showing, showing the world, world that love is love. love.